Thank you, Stephen, and good morning, everyone, which is a departure from the script, which should say good afternoon, but we're slightly ahead of schedule, which is good. Um, several speakers this morning have touched on our theme, which I re will remind you is sustainable futures, standards, skills, and a profession. And like others, I want to just take that apart very briefly. Particularly if I can advance the slide. There we go. Um, I'm not going to argue with the Brundtland definition. It's familiar to you all. Um, uh, and I'm certainly not going to argue, illustrated here, with uh, the shorter Oxford Dictionary, which I, I reached for to help me with this. Um, and the, a new clicker, thank you very much. New skills. Um, it comes from tenere, to hold, and the prefix here is sub, so we're holding something up from underneath. We're supporting it. And of course, there are other prefixes that we can put in front of this word. Uh, and from those, we get these deverbal nouns, um, some of which, possibly all of which, may be seen or welcome or otherwise over the coming three days. Sustenance, abstinence, continence, retention, hopefully, and maybe, if we're very lucky, entertainment. But sustainable future, what does that mean? As a, as a peasant, I have, to, I have to ask that question. What does that mean, actually? But again, next to the Shorter Oxford Dictionary is Fowler's Modern English Usage, and he has out-pedanted me and listed actually under meaningless words. So there we go. So I shall move on. Um, uh, but isn't the concept of the future already embedded in our definition of sustainability? I don't know if we're dealing with a tautology or a pleonasm, but I think, and I hope Hannah would agree with this, we need to be looking at a sustainable present. We can't procrastinate. We can't even perendinate, which is a good word for putting off until the day after tomorrow. We need to emphasize, making a pun, we need sustainable archeology span and we need a sustainable profession. And that's, that's the link that we have through, I believe, to ethics. We need to be trusted. That's why we need to be strong and persuasive in our ethical behavior. Again, why do we emphasize ethics? Because we're a profession, and professions are about trust. I'll come on to that onto that in a moment. And that archeology span has a purpose, our profession. We create value for business and society. We don't just do archeology span for our own entertainment. And if we're going to create that value for business and society, we need to do our job properly. And that means doing our work with professionalism for the benefit of others and to be trusted. So your old favorite slide, what is professionalism? Professionalism means being ethical. It means being competent. It means being accountable and working in the public interest. I'm going to take some of those words apart. Competent, we've already touched on that this morning in the previous two presentations. Professional competence, as defined by professional institutes, has two components, technical competence and ethical competence. How can we demonstrate our professionalism? Sorry, I am losing myself here. Too many scripts. Um, let's look at public interest first of all. Public interest definition on the screen, putting the needs and wishes of the public before the needs and wishes of archaeologists or their clients. Now, public interest, which is what drives our professionalism, is not the same thing 
as public benefit. Um, public benefit is, of course, the public benefit that we provide in so many different ways, as illustrated in the professional practice paper and elsewhere, um, is an element of how we work in the public interest, but it's not all of it. And public value is, again, another term which has been rather captured by public bodies in receipt of government funding in England and elsewhere. So it's quite a tricky word for us to use, but public interest, I think, is quite clear and it's an important element of professionalism. Ethical, um, let's just say, it means behaving in ways set out in the CIFA Code of Conduct, Professional Ethics in Archaeology. Now, our Code of Conduct is not the source of our ethics, it is an articulation of how we believe we should behave in order to sustain our ethical behavior, how we can support our values, how we could su support um, ethical reputation as well. So how do we demonstrate? Um, how do, right, I've missed a word as ever, ethical. Is, it, 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 we've dealt with accountable is the professional conduct process. And I will come on to that in a moment with a bit of history, but the point is we, as CIFA accredited professionals, have volunteered that if we are accused of being in breach of our code of conduct, we can be taken to task, we can be investigated, and we can have sanctions applied against us if we are found to have failed. How do we demonstrate our professionalism? By getting professionally accredited. That's what CIFA accreditation does. How do we assess it? Well, we assess our ethical competence uh, against uh, the code of conduct, and we assess our technical competence also against the, uh, the, the code of conduct because it, re it requires us to be, um, to be competent. But we also have other standards that have both ethical and technical dimensions. And how do we assess it now? You will know if you have been through the mill recently that applicants for accreditation by CIFA as individuals uh, now have to have an ethical competence assessment. Uh, it comes in a written form in your statement of competence. There are various ethical points you need to address. Uh, and if you are an applicant for MCFA, you also sit an oral interview where you are quizzed and have a good discussion with your peers about ethical dilemmas you have encountered. And I put ex ante there because that's a bit of cod Latinism that professions use to say that we look at people's competence before we admit them onto our register of professional people. And that we have always done for technical competence, but we have not really done it for ethical competence before. What we did before was have the ex post approach that many professional bodies do, which is trust that people will be ethically competent until something comes to light that suggests that maybe they're not and investigate then. We need to have that process. That's an essential part of being um, a professional having that accountability through the um, through a professional conduct process, but it's not enough on its own. It's not credible anymore not to test such an important thing as ethical competence before allowing people in. Fortunately, CIFA's work isn't all about testing or punishing people or investigating people. There are also lots of ethical resources we have. Uh, Ethical competence can be learned, ethical ability can be practiced, and there is support. Um, we've got an e-learning module online. We have quarterly CPD workshops, which are proving very popular, uh, getting very good feedback. Uh, I will talk more about those tomorrow in the session on ethics. We have our professional practice paper. There's been articles and indeed a, a whole edition of The Archaeologist looking at ethical behavior. 
with the Register of Professional Archaeologists, our sister body in the States, we have the vast resource that is archaeologicalethics.org. Uh, and we, have, we are now uh, consulting on revised standards and revised guidance. Now, those standards are closely related to the code. They describe the products and the outcomes that you need to achieve in certain activities to comply with the code. And there's guidance on how you might, but don't necessarily have to, achieve those outcomes. And we've revised policy statements about some of the more tricky areas of ethical behavior and the interface with um, our moral responsibilities as citizens and our legal responsibilities as citizens. So the code of conduct, as I say, isn't everything. It's not all our ethics in one place, but it's a very important document. And I would argue it's the most important document, perhaps other than the charter, that CIFA has. It's a core document in which we set out our stall, we express our values, we set out what we believe in, and we say how we are going to behave and the restrictions on our behavior and the require, additional requirements on our behavior that do not apply to other archaeologists that we have voluntarily imposed upon ourselves. And it's 40 years old, give or take a few additions. We're reviewing it. Uh, board has instructed that review, and it's, uh, it's in our strategic plan, and it's in last year's and this year's business plan. Uh, the review has a framework, and guess what? It's transparent. Um, we have an advisory panel of about 40 people who have in the past expressed a lot of interest um, in, in CIFA's ethics and how it uh, codifies its ethics. And uh, we, we try to draw that as, as widely and, uh, and from as diverse uh, a population of the CIFA membership as we can. Uh, they are supported and guided and, and, and helped by CIFA's advisory council. Uh, we've already had some discussions at advisory council meetings and we'll have a workshop in it at the next advisory council meeting uh, early next month. And the other people involved in the review are all CIFA members because it's our code doesn't matter what anyone else thinks about it. It's ours. We wrote it, we we, we and we can rewrite it, and we apply it to ourselves. And, um, you know, we, we explored some... I have a special dispensation from the chair to just go a little bit over time because we got ahead of schedule. In fact, I think I have a special instruction from the chair to go slightly over time on this. Um, we looked at pleonasm just now. Litoges is quite a good one, which when you use a noun um, to mean something less than what the word actually says. So a classic example would be Germany's reached the semi-final. No, Germany hasn't reached the semi-final. Some German footballers have reached the semi-final. CIFA is not the board. CIFA is not the board and it's our. CIFA is all of us, all of us who are accredited or non-accredited members of CIFA. And so the conversation about the code of conduct should not be about what CFA sh they should do. It's about what we should do and what we should write. There's been a scoping exercise, and it has identified some of the headline issues, which I'll unpack in a moment, um, of, of what is wrong or troubling or certainly needs to be looked at in our current code. And there is, as of yesterday lunchtime, uh, a live consultation on those issues. And I do hope that everybody will hear, will have a look at that. And I hope that also as many of you as can be motivated to do so, will actually respond to that consultation and give us your thoughts about your code and how it should change. Um, and there's a workshop on it tomorrow morning as well here in Nottingham. Uh, after that, when we've processed all of those results, we'll go through a phase of drafting, I uh, dare I say it, many phases of drafting, uh, and we will consult again on that. 
and probably redraft all over again. And finally, when we've honed up a draft, it will go to the highest decision-making organization in CIFA, which is all of us, again, at a general meeting. Technically, in our constitution, the um, Code of Conduct is a regulation. There are several regulations in, in, in our constitution. It is in the gift of the board to alter all of those regulations without consulting the membership, apart or without the membership's permission, um, apart from one, and that is the code of conduct. It, it, we wrote that into the constitution because it would not be right not to have everyone sign up to a body that in, a, a document that important. So, headline issues are. Do CIFA accredited professionals fully understand the commitment they made when they applied for CIFA, when they signed various documents, when they pay the subscriptions, the contract, as I like to think of it, but certainly the binding obligation that they have entered into with their fellow archaeologists to behave in certain ways? Do they understand um, the implications of that? There's some evidence that not everybody does, and there's lots of evidence that it's all explained in the preamble to the code, and nobody ever reads the preamble to the code because they want to go straight to the rules to find out what's gone wrong. Is the code consistent with modern values? Certainly the advisory panel is of the view that there's some horribly out-of-date things in the code, and again, we'll look at those a little tomorrow, but if you've got a code that talks about the difference between rescue archaeology and research archaeology, you're probably not up to date with modern thinking. That needs to change, I am sure. And the code was written from a variety of sources by UK archaeologists with a view to its application in the UK. And if we're going to be the global institution that CIFA wants to be, that needs looking at. And I'm very pleased that both CIFA Deutschland and CIFA Australia have now nominated people to help with that process. But of course, we have members all around the globe. And of course, we have to also recognise that the vast majority of us are UK. But I think we can address a lot of the issues we've heard about this morning if we try and be a bit less UK and frankly, a lot less English in the way we present ourselves. And then there's the structure of the code with its fairly familiar three principles in the middle, two, three, and four, about conservation, recording, and dissemination, bookended by some general stuff about good behavior at the front and some important stuff, and principle five, about the treatment of our fellow archaeologists. Is that the right structure? Does it recognize the, the beneficiaries to that code? The, the public, the clients, as well as the other archaeologists. And the language is pretty horrible because it's a quasi-legal document and we really need to look at the modality, i.e. The, the shoulds, the musts, the mays. Is it a member shall? Is it a member will? Is it a CIFA member will? Is it an archaeologist should? Is it I will? All these need to be looked at. So back to why we emphasize ethics and we're going to hear this afternoon about key messages from CIFA. Here's one. Using an accredited archaeologist assures clients that the work will meet their needs and is carried out in the public interest. It's about trust again. CIFA was awarded a charter because it acts in the public interest, because of its durability, it is sustainable, said the Privy Council, because of the impact that it has and because of its good governance structures. The code is a binding obligation, as I've said, between members and the beneficiaries of the public. And the Privy Council maintains at least a theoretical oversight of our behaviour to make sure that that remains so and that we are working in the public interest and not in the self-interest of archaeologists. We do that too, but that's not the primary purpose for which we got that charter. 
And if we ever wanted to demonstrate to ourselves and others that we are ready and worthy of becoming a chartered profession, which we're not at the moment because CIFA does not have the powers to award the title chartered archaeologist or chartered anything to anyone, um, we must have a fit-for-purpose code to sustain our profession into the future. And that, Stephen, is, is what I had to say on uh, archaeological ethics, but I have been given permission, and Stephen knows this, to do a short, relevant plug of this, which we talked about a lot last year, um, Archaeology and Construction, the Good Practice Guide, uh, published by Syria. And that's the point. I mean, it may be written by archaeologists, by Mola, Sifa, Taza, but it's published by the Construction Industry Research and Information Association. It is, therefore, the construction industry's work, and it and Syria is the is the go-to place um, f in that industry for advice. And the reason I'm mentioning it is, in partnership with Syria, we have a special offer. And there is a leaflet upstairs that you can gather, which has details of how to get a stunning 20% off this publication. And uh, if you're watching online, uh, there is access to that uh, discount also through Shed. There's some advice on how to get hold of this leaflet and then what to do. Um, so 20% off, hurrah, until the end of the month. Uh, just to say what's in the guide, very briefly, it looks at the stages in the construction process very generically, and it maps the archaeological process against it. These slides are pretty hard to read, but if you get the book, then you can actually see what the words say as well. But this, I hope, illustrates that, that general mapping, and that's very important because there often isn't mutual understanding between the two sectors on how it all fits together. And when you then put that generic process against the various um, uh, best fit, uh, various gateways and stages and so, so on and so forth, the, the, the Reba stages and such like, it gets to be a very complicated diagram, but that's the sort of thing the construction industry wants to see. And one of the messages in that guide is that if developers are ethical, if they have social impact targets to meet, if they're interested in social, environmental and human capital, and if they're part of the construction sector's commitment to these, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, then they are incredibly lucky to have archaeologists on their projects because nothing is going to help them meet those goals more effectively than the imagination of archaeologists and what they can bring, uh, particularly through their engagement with communities, but also through training, through apprenticeships, and so many other things. Um, you've got a special offer because we think it's very useful for archaeologists to have this book. It's not written for you but it's written about you, and it's probably useful to know what we and what the construction industry is saying about you and the value that you bring to, to projects. Uh, so please take a look at it. There's a copy upstairs. Please buy it if you like, but most importantly, please encourage your clients to read it, and you might find that they value you more after having done so. End of plug, Stephen. I'm done. <laughs>